this is a safe woman. She's <laughs> got no bones. <laughs> She's not real. She's not real. <laughs> I mean, not only is she Venus, but I mean, who is she really? Botticelli. Oh. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Corey. I'm Natalie. I'm Jen, and we are the Art History Babes. We have a baby episode for you today. For those of you who don't know, baby episodes are short, little, kind of to the point episodes that don't have any expletives. So you can use them in school. (laughs) (laughs) And around the children. Around the kiddos. Um, Today, we're talking about Birth of Venus. Which does, it does have some uh, sexual... <laughs> sexual content. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll just take it easy with that, but we will talk about it. Yeah. Just in a, a very... Uh, I just realized I said you can play it in front of your kids, so I should probably tell people that it's coming. Yeah, and then this is now going to speak it, to the level of your parenting. How much <laughs> do you talk to your kids about this stuff? We don't know. So, um, turn and, back now. Or, like, do you want That's them not. to learn about sex through the art history, babes? We'll do it. We'll do it. You know? We'll do a hot takes sex ed episode. Oh, <laughs> man. When mommies and daddies love each other very much. <laughs> It'll be great. But, yeah, this painting, this painting's sexy. It's a sexy painting. Um, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. Yeah. It's one of those that most people know about. So <laughs> we might as well get... Or have seen, at Yeah, least. yeah. exactly. It's a recognizable image, for sure. Should we start with some facts? Some facts. <laughs> Sandro Botticelli, born in 1445, was an Italian Renaissance painter. He belonged to the Florentine school, training in the workshop of Fra Filippo Lippi, and eventually working under the patronage of Lorenzo de' Medici. He lived his entire life in the same neighborhood in Florence, which is, I just think is cute. That is really cute. <laughs> he just liked his home, wow. and that's nice. He's known for painting mainly portraits and religious subjects. However, his mythological subjects, although few in number, are some of his most famous works. The Birth of Venus is often discussed with Botticelli's other large-scale mythological work, Primavera. Although they are not a pair, the paintings are significant because depictions of subjects from classical mythology on a very large scale were virtually unprecedented in Western art since classical antiquity. The size and prominence of a nude female figure in The Birth of Venus was also uncommon in the early Renaissance. We'll talk about that a little bit more a little later on. The work was commissioned for the home of Lorenzo di... Pier Francesco de Medici. Wow. Good job. (laughs) Thank you. And was meant to hang above a marital bed. Beautiful. Right? That seems like a nice spot. That's where I would want it. Right? It's so big, though. How big was the bed? Hopefully very large. Yeah, humongous. (laughs) I I really like to imagine a, a just huge like l- luscious bed with, <laughs> with birth of venus hanging above I mean, it and if you're a, a medici you better have <laughs> the most luscious bed right, I mean, they right? Were wealthy do you think they called it like a florentine king instead of a california king uh oh. wow Ooh, probably. probably they probably. should <laughs> new goals get a florentine <laughs> king size bed <laughs> with a botticelli over the top dang there we go i'm gonna start i'm gonna start visualizing that manifest that into my life i know i'm seeing it right now <laughs> <laughs> in the early renaissance painting on canvas wasn't really a thing uh, they were pretty much all about painting on panels However, wood panel was susceptible to warp due to humidity, and canvas started to become a more commonly used and often looked down upon medium. Birth of Venus is said to be the first work of its size painted on canvas in Tuscany. Wonderful. So let's take a closer look. I think we didn't quite throw out a date. We have a a date here. Circa 1484 to around 1486 is when we're dating this work. In the middle, in the center, we are presented with the newly born goddess 
Venus and she is nude and standing in a giant uh, scallop shell. On the left she is flanked by the wind god Zephyr who uh, blows at her and the wind is shown by the lines that are radiating from his mouth. He's in the air and he also is carrying a young female who is also blowing but less forcefully. They both have wings and uh, so Vasari who was a writer of art history, one of the earliest art historians we could probably yeah, say. Yeah, he was like the, the, the OG, art, OG historian. art historian. Vasari was probably correct when he identified her as Aura, the personification of a light breeze, which I think mm. is very sweet. It's calming. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in their joint effort, they're blowing Venus towards the shore. So what's the old story? She was... We'll, uh, we'll get there. Okay, we'll get there. <laughs> There's a story. So in their joint efforts, they are blowing Venus towards the shore. On the right is a female figure who appears to be floating slightly above the ground, and she's holding out a rich cloak to dress Venus when she reaches the shore. She's one of the three ore or hours. Uh, these are Greek minor goddesses of the seasons and of other divisions of time and also they are attendants of Venus. The floral decoration on of her dress suggests that she is the Hora of Spring. So the subject is not strictly the birth of Venus. It's a title only given to the painting in the 19th century, though this was given as the subject by Vasari. The next scene in her story where she arrives on land blown by the wind seems to be what we're actually seeing. The land probably represents either Scythera or Cyprus, both Mediterranean islands regarded by the Greeks as territories of Venus. So the story, let's get to it. The mythology. In mythology, Venus, or Aphrodite to the Greeks, Venus to the Romans, was born on the island of Paphos. As it goes, Uranus and Gaia had a son named Cronos, or Cronus, or Cronos, I'm gonna say Cronos. Uranus and Gaia got into a heated debate, and Gaia gave Cronus a sickle, a la the Grim Reaper, just to give you a visual, with which to attack his father. Cronus castrated Uranus and threw his genitalia into the sea. Brutal. Yeah, right? It's pretty rough. Yeah, talk about Oedipus complex. <laughs> According to mythology, the testicles and the sea foam mix together to produce the goddess of love and beauty who emerges from the foam as a fully formed woman. In reference to Botticelli's depiction of the scene, this has led some to believe that the seashell that Venus is riding to shore upon represents a vagina. Oh. Yes. Yes. Because she is being birthed from it. Mm -hmm. and Get it? Yeah. <laughs> Birth. Birth of Venus. <laughs> she is being birthed yes. from this symbol. But wow. while that was a visual choice of Botticelli, it is worth mentioning that Venus was not conceived naturally by a man and a woman, but by a man in nature, and we should probably talk about that a little, because in the same way, there's a, there's a meowing cat. <laughs> yeah, she's just Hi, kitten. Wanting attention real bad. I love you. Oh, is this Wheezy? Yeah. It's a fat kitten. She's, she's large. <laughs> insane. Always. Okay. <laughs> she's my favorite shape. She's an absolute yeah. unit. She's, yeah, she she's really her own is. Shape. She really is an absolute unit. <laughs> I'm in awe at the size of her. <laughs> so, in the same way that Jesus Christ was con was conceived purely and without the need for heterosexual sex, which, if you're gonna get into like religion and stuff, is impure. So it's a no-no. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just no it's, good. It's sticky. It's a <laughs> sticky topic. So the major, the major difference though between the birth of Venus and the birth of Christ is that a human man was not needed for the conception of Christ and a human female was not needed for the conception or creation of Venus because at least Mary like brought Christ to birth. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? She carried right. him. Right. Whereas there's no woman involved at all in the creation of Venus. It's man mm. and nature, and then produces 
you know, the god of love. So what does it mean if the ultimate symbol of kind of sex, love, fertility is made sans woman? Oh my god, I have some thoughts. I do too, because I feel like also, you know, nature being is, is often considered like a divine feminine force. Mm -hmm. You know, nature mm -hmm. and the feminine are related a lot throughout history. Mm -hmm. So I think it could be looked at as just like a bigger representation of woman, but it could also be looked at through the lens of the patriarchy. Which is <laughs> That's the lens what I was that thinking. it was invented in, yeah. so we should probably... I think it could be a little bit of both, depending, because I, I, I think that that story has, has some interesting layers, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I want to think of it in the first way that you mentioned, as, as nature being the divine feminine, but I'm also highly prone to believe that this idea of like r removing sexuality from women and making it a male created thing yes is just like it's the ultimate power move that, that they is can pull. that's just patriarchy 101 i yeah. i i agree 100 percent, and i think you're right but i do like that i think this image can be looked at in a mm -hmm. in a more like um empowering way if you want to yeah. like examine it that way but i agree in the context of just the myth and the con like what i know about greek mythology and how they weren't big fans of women it does sound very patriarchal yeah and we should specify that when we're talking about you know the kind of misogynist bend to this story we're talking about the mythology not Botticelli necessarily yeah, yeah. we don't know what his thoughts were and he didn't invent the story he's just representing it mm -hmm. and his claims that he was using a more contemporary poem as his yeah. inspiration uh, for the visuals versus the original mythology and that I think is just a good thing to remember about ancient mythology in general is like there are a lot of different ways to look at a lot of these stories mm -hmm. we're examined through various lenses throughout the entire course of human history and have taken on new meanings so like yeah i you definitely can't say that that this is botticelli's viewpoint there's, there there's definitely a statement being made with that myth well like, yes. i think that is fair to say yeah oh the wasp is back. oh no <laughs> oh no so <laughs> many interruptions there's a wasp so we're attempting to... Should we to take our break now instead? Yeah, we're going to take we'll a break. We'll take our break a little early. We're going to take a quick break and deal with this. Yeah. Right, bye. Bye. <laughs> Wheezy, I'm trying to get some footage of you. The people want to see you, Wheezy. Hey. Hey, cutie. Hey, buddy. Listeners often wonder what kind of equipment we use for the podcast. As you can see, we have our mixer, we have our microphones, and of course, our studio brand headphones. Studio headphones are great quality. We've been using them for a long time, and they're high-quality headphones with a sleek design and lots of different options, many different styles to choose from. And lucky for you, we're currently doing a promotion with Studio Headphones. So if you would like 15% off your first order of Studio Headphones, head over to studio.com and use promo code ARTHISTORYBABE. We have returned. We uh, took took care of the situation. <laughs> we, we hope. We yeah. Back to birth of Venus. Here we go. So uh, the work was was kind of like controversial back in Renaissance times. When it was first painted, it was controversial not because it was a naked lady, but because it was a naked lady in a non-Christian context. Mm. So in the Western art of the Middle Ages and early Renaissance. Figures were only painted in the nude to promote a Christian teaching of some sort. For example, scenes of Adam and Eve's impure naked bodies being dispelled from the Garden of Eden because of all of their impure impurity. <laughs> <laughs> Not only was the story in Birth of Venus from a classical non-Christian mythology, but this is an image that kind of seems to like celebrate or idealize nudity in some sense. And people didn't really know what to do with that. Right. This idea of nudity and 
appreciation for the female body outside of any sort of... It, I, I think, from what I've heard, that the loophole to this problem of not being able to show nude women was kind of using classical mythology yeah, as yeah. your, you know, excuse, rationale, whatever you want to call it. That makes sense. That men could have this these paintings in their studies a lot of times. So this one we're talking about was made for a bedroom. But for a lot of the other paintings of nude women, especially those representing classical, classical mythology, they were for men's studies because they are supposed to symbolize like wisdom yes beauty, yes or <laughs> the higher pursuits of course um, <laughs> the high the higher pursuits ah uh, yes <laughs> if you study the high pursuits you get to gaze upon nude women yeah <laughs> we, we're not exactly sure what botticelli's ideas of women or sexuality were but we do know that later on in life his religious views took a sharp turn. So in the last years of his life, his work became overtly religious and he became a follower of a fanatical Christian preacher. Some have suggested that he rejected his early work, such as The Birth of Venus. There's even claims that Botticelli threw some of his works into a bonfire of the vanities. The bonfire of the vanities! The oh, man. bonfire of the vanities. So for those of you who don't know, the Bonfire of the Vanities was a mass burning of objects such as art, jewelry, mirrors, vanities, if you will. And this was all instigated by the Dominican friar Girolamo oh, Savonarola. That's how you say There it. we go. There we go. Um, and this all went down on February 7th, 1497. And so the idea was that these objects promoted sin and took glory away from God. Somehow, despite the controversy surrounding it, Birth of Venus was spared. Wow. Wow. Didn't get didn't get burnt up with all the rest of the vanities. For real. It was too big. It would have been such a house. Yeah. You know, yeah. It would have been a th the whole thing. It really yeah. would have. I mean, I'm sure that um, Medici owning it had nothing to do with it. <laughs> After his death, Botticelli's paintings kind of fell out of favor for a while, until the 19th century. And even then, Primavera was his best known work. Birth of Venus was not nearly as popular. Interestingly, the Birth of Venus became well known due to a series of traveling exhibitions to celebrate the old Italian masters, which was organized by none other than Mussolini. Hmm. That's peculiar. Because, you know, Mussolini's got to come into the story somehow. <laughs> somehow. I was just waiting for you to mention Mussolini. Everyone was. <laughs> you can all breathe now. <laughs> the exhibitions were planned for political gain, but this work by Botticelli was selected for more practical purposes. So, like Corey had mentioned earlier, it was painted on canvas, unlike Primavera, which was painted on wood. And canvas is a lot easier to transport without fear of serious damage, like warping or cracking the wood. The painting was extremely well received in London, Paris, and at the 1935 San Francisco's World Fair. And then five years later, it brought a whopping 290,000 people to New York's MoMA in a 74-day period. Wow. All right, all right, all yeah. right. Birth of Venus, you guys, have you all seen it? Yes. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it in person. So it's at the Uffizi. And it is very stunning to see in person. Definitely should if you the get the scale opportunity. It's just Yeah. It's huge and Did we talk about six by nine feet? I don't know if we ever actually mentioned the exact it's, dimension. It's a big pain. Yeah. Six feet by nine feet, guys. So you're kind of immersed in into this image. But what was particularly interesting to me, so when visiting the Uffizi in Florence, I noticed that the institution provides a tactile version of the painting for visitors with impaired vision. And this, I thought that was just super cool when I yeah. saw it. I was like, that's amazing. Caused me to look into it a little bit more. And apparently the Uffizi offers an entire Uffizi by touch tour that includes what? a map and descriptions of many works in Braille. And the tour <clears> includes <throat> several statues, many of which belonged to the Medici collection. And visitors are given special gloves and they are actually allowed to touch the actual sculptures, not that's reproductions. Amazing. That is so cool. Right? 
And so they get to actually have this very like immersive experience with the artwork. The experience of the birth of Venus on this tour is a, a smaller relief style sculpture of the painting that is located in front of where the painting hangs. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, so yeah, it's kind of creating a relief experience of the painting. So all around, just just a cool thing. Yeah. That is so awesome. I, know. I love that. Right? The I would have. I would have never even thought about that. Right? Yeah. The Uffizi is just a great museum in general, and I love that this painting stayed in Florence. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. <laughs> just just yeah. like Botticelli. Oh. Just like it's Aww. Papa. It's Aww. how it's how old bots would have liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Papa bots. <laughs> <laughs> Papa Butts. <laughs> that's that's what we call him. Yeah. In in our circle, that's what we're allowed to call him that. Pop Butt. <laughs> Old Daddy Butts. <laughs> oh oh man. All right. So let's do just a little a little visual analysis. Let's look at the painting and think about some things, okay. you guys, because that's what all good art historians do, right? I love it. <laughs> so we're looking at it. I think the first thing that we can discuss a little bit, and this is an issue that pops into a lot of Venus images, is kind of the impossibility of the pose. Um, she would fall over. Like, she would straight fall over. Right. No, like, one, no one's body can actually stand this way. I feel like it's, it's an attempt awkward. at a very, like, feminine... <laughs> Nat is trying to do it right now. <laughs> it is. I mean, but your foot would have to be... Yeah, I don't know, girl. No, it's super awkward. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's a lot. And, uh, like, because I feel like if you look at the feet, it looks as though her weight is is on this foot, but the way her upper body is, it's not pushing that way, you know what I mean? So I feel like the weight is not... Right. And here's the thing about these works, and we see it a lot later in, like, romantic paintings, like... The Grand Odalisque. Mm -hmm. You know how her body doesn't make any sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This sort of notion of a feminine body that couldn't really exist in real life. No one is appreciating these forms for, like, would she actually be able to stand? You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's like an awkward kind of, like, kind of trying to be contrapposto. Yeah, exactly. Not, We're not quite there yet. I... I feel like it's a feminized ideal attempt at a contrapposto. Yeah, and it's, I think this is one of those situations where not necessarily having access to female models, live models, uh, they're working from multiple sources that are mm -hmm. not exact references, me male bodies a lot of times, and then kind of trying to add boobs later. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Birds, <laughs> right. Which was totally a thing. Well, I think that they get a little bit better at this into like high renaissance. But mm -hmm. even like Leonardo you know? da Vinci has a lot where if you look, it's like a jacked man and then just little boots <laughs> like it in and, and well, not okay. trying to like act like you know obviously women come in all shapes and sizes but the, to the point that you are like he he painted a man no no then, but we, yeah. we i think that we can say with a level of certainty that those were men yes exactly <laughs> they were yeah not yeah. trying to like right talk about women's bodies that way like it straight up was a male model right that he then he later tried to i don't convert. know if da vinci ever saw a nude woman i don't know that there's any evidence <laughs> he ever did i'm serious i, I really, really don't straight think up he had an did. art history professor oh. who made it seem that he never would have mm -hmm. and that this that's was very common. interesting that's very interesting ah uh, yes ah uh, yes i uh, yes what else do we have here um so the detailing i think the decorative detailing elements of this painting is just widely talked about and is also i think what kind of sets it apart what makes it even more beautiful has kind of you know helped to make it the masterpiece that it is first you have the fabrics which have these like beautiful decorative patterns mm -hmm. on the fabrics which is mm -hmm. very interesting billowing there's a lot of billowing there is a lot of billowing happening you also have like the gold detailing in her like in her hair and in the shell mm -hmm. which is a very striking detail yeah well, and he's almost famous for this hair color right this like yeah little, it's like a botticelli red yeah like it's a reddish blondish yeah like this copper headed it's beautiful uh, hair and look, color. all the women have it it's he, he kind of coined it wow idea um art history babes uh hair dye 
line. Botticelli oh. red. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Probably so many more good ones. Oh yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Um, what I really love about this painting, so this is so early Renaissance to me. This is such a quintessential work because I really feel like this whole idea of like space isn't mm -hmm. really fleshed out yet. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. There's very shallow space in this work, and you can tell they're, they're kind of trying to, to have a, a level of, of space. You see, like, the very thin strip of land that's supposed to be very far away behind the body of Venus. However, we're not seeing any kind of atmospheric perspective at mm -hmm. this point, although it did exist. Botticelli just wasn't utilizing it. Yeah, he's almost like air renaissance naturalism and mannerism kind of meet. Yeah. Where he's doing a little bit of both. He's trying to be natural at points, mm -hmm. and I think overall it reads as a little bit more naturalism or right. whatever like, you would like to call it. It definitely has those manners qualities of like the elongated going back to the bodies mm. like the kind of elongated arms and legs and mm -hmm. like where's that bone <laughs> right i also really like the scalloped wave pattern like yeah, the yeah waves looking would at that never look like yeah. that you know yeah. like you get the suggestion of waves like there the, are waves happening the idea <laughs> of waves yeah. um so that's i like that a lot and yeah i feel like nat really hit it on the head. Especially now I'm like looking at her neck and like the way that her neck is kind right. of elongated. Like what's up with that neck? Yeah, and at an interesting angle like that's that's mannerist and mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So this painting is often considered like a pinnacle of beauty. It is often used as a beauty standard to which other objects of beauty from various time periods have been compared. It has also widely been subverted as a means of commentary on beauty standards. Lots of, so lots of heavy things there. So basically, like, why do we love it? Why do we love this painting so much? And in what ways do you guys consider this painting to be representative of beauty? Just kind of cutting back to what we were just talking about, like the elongated features and that kind of thing is already where my eyes are starting to like roll to the back of my head about yeah. <laughs> why we would consider that to be an ideal of beauty nowadays. And it's been, I mean, it's been popular for a while, so I'm not trying to put it all in the 21st century. But yeah, anyways, yeah, yeah. But I think the reason it's still in favor is we're all about almost this unattainable beauty that is now attainable mm -hmm. via things like plastic surgery and all of that. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Like, corsets are back. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think when it comes to exactly, like, the feminine image, just the whole idealized woman beauty standards thing is, I don't know, at this point, it's like, are we done with this yet, you know? I think we're getting there. Um, however, yeah. I do want to kind of mention, going back to what I was saying before, I do think there are things about this painting that are a little bit more of like an objective beauty thing like i was saying like the decorative patterning and stuff humans are inherently attracted to patterning that's why like decorative patterns are just they're naturally appealing to the human mind you know so i think there are elements this painting that are in some way representative of what humans find beautiful but then i think when you're thinking more in terms of the body figures and the human beings re being rep represented, I think that is more of this, like, yeah, idealized creation of beauty that we've created. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it fits, yeah. because she's being created in this scene, like, yeah, her, and she's the goddess of beauty, so, I mean, just in the storyline and the title and everything, we just already are thinking of the epitome of quote-unquote beauty yeah I mean and she is beautiful I mean if we break it down you know if let's just say we're talking from a western point of view in considering uh what's traditionally beautiful from what I can tell a symmetrical face mm -hmm. long flowing hair there's a lot of flowing <laughs> in the wind many flowing there's elements flowing, you know <laughs> so this color used to be all the rage back when they would like try and lighten their hair with I love it. Chemicals. It's such a good color. <laughs> like we don't do that now. I'm talking about it. Like, this is such an ancient practice. <laughs> back when they used to do that. 
there's evidence of like a muscularness, but it's very much uh, <laughs> concealed by a lot of soft mm -hmm. angles. It's very soft. She's so soft, in fact, that her <laughs> shoulders How soft is she? <laughs> her shoulders make no, no sense. sense anatomically. Yeah. What is going on with that, this arm? That, that is, is it has quite to follow the wave of her hair. Apparently. Yeah, exactly. The arm. There's no real bones in that arm. And so these things to us sound so ridiculous, but when we, if we are thinking of what's considered beautiful in a Western male gaze dominated discourse of beauty, then she's the epitome. Her, I, she, I also you know. think there's something to just the way the mind perceives like flowing and smooth lines. As opposed to, because like, yeah, this arm makes no sense, but it's also just following like a smooth curve. Mm -hmm. And so she doesn't look like, when you look at it and think about it logically, it, all of a sudden it looks very weird. But right. I think on first glance, you just see a smooth line. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, what I love about this is I'm thinking like 400 years later when Manet came out with Olympia mm -hmm. and everyone was losing their minds yeah. because you were seeing an anatomically sound structure of a woman's body. And there was a sharpness to her. And she like, was sharp and people were very upset. So and they could and, recognize who she was. Yeah, right. And her, they knew her class and... Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was a lot. So, you know, we're talking, this is a safe woman. She's got no bones. <laughs> She's not real. She's not real. I mean, not only is she heinous, but I mean, who is she really? I yeah. mean, she could be anybody. These are pretty standard, generic features of a pretty face. She's just something for you to project your Absolutely. idealized visions And for onto. many, that is really the epitome of beauty. So, yeah. for the time, for the purpose... I think that this is an excellent work of art because it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's yeah, especially at a time where yeah, you're just trying to achieve beauty with art a lot of the time like that. I do think that he was yeah, doing what he was supposed to do, but I do think this work continues to be interesting because of everything that's come from it mm -hmm. and the fact that we can subvert this image and we can think about this image in different ways. Yeah. Definitely, and it has been as we saw at the Louvre. Even like, there, it's everywhere, and they yeah. don't even have it. Or was that Primavera? I think that the Louvre has Primavera because isn't or does the Uffizi have both? No. Oh, mm. it might. Mystery. I don't know. I don't know where the Primavera is. We don't know right at this moment, <laughs> but we do know that the birth of Venus exists at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, and if you ever have a chance... Check it out, man. Go see it. I mean... Go see yeah. her and her boneless yeah. existence. So she's got no bones. <laughs> also at the Uffizi. Uh. But I swear to you that the Louvre uses the image of the birth of Venus as I could see that. I, I could see all that. all over the Louvre. I have such a distinct memory. I feel like birth of Venus is another one of those those big images similar to the Mona Lisa that just gets thrown on everything to represent art, to be like, it's art. Yeah. Birth of Venus, it's art, you yeah. know? So I think that image does get used all over the place. Birth of Venus. It's a painting. <laughs> Check it out. Check it it's out. A big painting. It's a beautiful painting. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you want to see our faces while we talked about all this and look at some images of the stuff we talked about, head over to our YouTube channel where this episode will be posted and you know check out our other stuff email us follow us on social media all the things y'all i forgot we were, were um, awesome recording this yeah like on, right there i forgot hello hi <laughs> check us all out follow us on everything and uh we love you bye bye, bye. Woo. Philippo? Yes. <laughs> Philippo! <laughs>